Welcome everyone to the Social Finance and Investment Readiness webinar. My name is Wayne Miranda, the Connell Foundation, I'm working very closely with InnoWeave. And InnoWeave is a organization and program of the Connell Foundation that helps other organizations, collaboratives innovate. Um, there's multiple different streams where we help organizations understand what their intended impact is and their theory of change or what collective impact they might have. Um, and in each module, we connect organizations to resources, to tools, to templates, to coaching supports. Today, what, though, we're just going to focus on one of those 10 modules, and that is social finance. So in particular for this webinar and the next hour that we have together, um, our roadmap is that we're going to talk through some examples of social finance. So for those who are coming in and perhaps just a little bit new to this concept, that's totally okay. This is the first time you're learning about it. This is a really great session. And if you are an intermediate or an expert person joining today, um, you know, we're going to we're going to get into other topics as well, such as demystifying what investment ready actually means and and you know, who might you go to to access social finance investment to advance your mission and your organization? And then we'll get into some next steps. So if that's a good roadmap for today, I always like to begin with some shared language. And social finance can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And, and truly, there is not one single way that is the most accurate or that is the right way. So I always like to you know, start with some shared language. When I'm referring to social finance for the next hour at least, um, I'm referring to two key elements. I'm talking about repayable investment and repayable investment can take on many different forms. It can, um, it can look like loans, it could be a mortgage, it could be a line of credit, maybe as simple as a credit card. Um, it could be something more complicated such as equity investment in a, in a for-profit social enterprise. Um, so owning shares. It could also be slightly more complicated things that are in the middle of loans and equity. It could be revenue share agreements or social impact bonds. We can get into the different forms of repayable investment, but what it means is that you're taking money up front to do something with, with an expectation that you're going to repay that money at some point in the future. And all of those tools, all those um, forms of social finance that I've just referred to, you know, probably sound very traditional. Um, very, you know, not unlike what you'd hear in just mainstream finance. And so what's the real difference here? You know, how is social finance anything different? Well, social finance is repayable investment that specifically and explicitly seeks a positive social, environmental, and or cultural impact at the end of the day. And these two things are part and parcel. Um, so social finance is repayable investment that seeks a positive societal change. So let's just check in around the table here. We've got 20 some odd participants, which is fantastic. Um, you know, do you already have an idea or a plan to use social finance in your organization or um, with organizations that you might be volunteering with or providing services to, to enhance your impact? So I'll just launch this poll, which should show up on your screens in a few seconds. Um, and so, you know, maybe you're just coming to this session to learn and that's totally okay. So you know, maybe you may not be seeking repayable investment, or maybe the answer is not quite yet. Maybe you need some help ideating, generating concepts as to how social finance can be useful in your organization. Or maybe you do have a clear idea of how it might be useful. And so maybe that is to purchase an asset, like buy a building or a distribution van for your social enterprise. Or maybe you need to do a, a savings generation retrofit project to save on utility bills with green retrofits, or maybe you want to launch a new social enterprise like an employment generating cafe, or maybe you want to scale your existing cafe so that you can social franchise it or, or um, grow out your, your, your social enterprise into new geography, or maybe you've got some other ideas. And so if you do have other ideas, please do share those in the chat. So I'll just give you another couple seconds to fill in the poll. Um, but it looks like we've got a good group here, some, some organizations um, that are looking to start social enterprises, others that are looking to purchase assets, and some just looking to learn. So excellent. Thank you so much for your responses. I'm going to share that. So here's who's around the table today. 
um, you know, really good mix. And, and not surprisingly, a lot of organizations and a lot of you are looking to either launch or grow a social enterprise. And, and we'll certainly get into all of these types of use cases. Thank you so much for sharing. I'll get these off your screen. All right, so I'd like to get into some examples. Um, so on your left-hand side of the screen here, I've got five different, um, you know, just use cases, and, and these are not comprehensive use cases. These may just be typical use cases for the social sector to consider and, and how you might use social finance to advance your mission. Um, so the first use case is purchasing an asset. And Vancouver Community Land Trust is a great example of an organization, it's a nonprofit cooperative, and it raised about $10 million to build affordable housing. And so the investment is expected to be repaid over eight years, and they use rental income from the units um, to repay that investment. And the investor in this case is New Market Funds. Um, New Market Funds purchased shares, so equity investment, from Vancouver uh, Community Land Trust, and that's what will be sold back over eight years' time. So ultimately, it's a nonprofit cooperative. It will be wholly owned by the cooperative over time. And the investor is just providing the upfront investment to make the affordable housing project happen to begin with. So a great example of a nonprofit cooperative using social finance investments. So using the idea of payable investment to do what otherwise may not have been possible through a more traditional capital campaign or government grants or contribution agreements or what have you. So that's the first example, purchasing an asset. This next example is um, spending now to earn revenue later. So example is Center 3 for Print and Media Arts raised a $35,000 loan. And what they did with that money is to build out their fundraising capacity. So they hired a development officer. This development officer raised money to both repay the loan, which in this case came from an, an investor called Community Forward Fund. And this development officer also generated unrestricted funds to support the organization at, at its whole. So they ran an art circle membership program and they offered ongoing workshops and classes to the community and that generated revenue. And so not only was Center 3 able to repay the loan, but they also generated unrestricted, unrestricted funds, which is you know, uh, really valuable for nonprofits um, so that they can advance their mission in so many different ways as well. So a great example of using social finance to do what they couldn't have otherwise done initially. Um, so they could spend and, and sort of hire this development officer for the purposes of generating revenue later on, which is great. So this next example is sort of the flip side of that. So spending now to prevent future costs. Um, this example is uh, a slightly more complicated example. It's, it's a tool called a social impact bond. So S Southern First Nations Network of Care raised a $2.6 million social impact bond. It's a repayable investment. What they did with this money is they connect at-risk Indigenous mothers with birth helpers, doulas. And the aim here is to prevent babies from spending time in the child welfare system. Um, and so in turn, what this allows the government to do is accrue public health care savings. So if this program achieves specific results that would be independently verified by third parties, then the government of Manitoba will have accrued savings over a period of time, and they would then be in a position to repay investors. So this is a social impact bond structure because it is a tripartite agreement. You've got Southern First Nations Network of Care, an implementing services agency. Um, they are paid up front to run their programming, which, which has been demonstrated to be successful and, and, and effective. Um, but that took upfront investors. And so um, foundations and other upfront investors put up the money, the initial risk capital to run these programs with the expectation that once it is successful and those outcomes are achieved, which is reducing uh, children from spending time in the welfare system, the government will have accrued savings and then will repay those investors. So a slightly more complicated version um, of social finance, but a really great one, social impact bonds. Um, another example of spending now to prevent future costs is retrofits. So in this case, 
the um, Harborfront Center, which is a cultural hub in Toronto, they raised $95,000 from the Atmospheric Fund to upgrade its lighting to LED lights, which is a more efficient, and install a more efficient boiler. And all of these things reduced their utility costs, so generated savings. But to generate those savings, it took upfront investment to do those retrofits. So what they've done is um, invested, generated utility costs, which are savings, and taken a portion of those future savings and redirected it towards repaying their investment. And the business case and the use case for retrofits is very well established. The Atmospheric Fund is doing this a lot and other partners as well now. So the, you know, the last two examples are examples of sort of more cash flow financing. So you know, being able to spend now to either generate revenue later or generate savings later. These next few examples are about social enterprise. Social enterprise being about the sale of a good or a service with the purpose of social environmental or cultural impact. So this example is um, Cooperative de Solidarité Wabak. So um, they launched a community grocery and it's a hardware store on the reserve. Um, and this enabled you know, reservists and community members to reduce their travel, which was 37 kilometers or some and, and more, or more um, to their, their closest alternative. And it also allowed the reserve to create um, local employment. And their investor, Chantier de l'Economie Sociale Trust, invested $250,000 as a startup loan, which will be repaid back after 15 years through the grocery and hardware store revenues. So a great example of launching a new social enterprise, it creates employment, it reduces travel, um, and this was a social impact investment. Another example of scaling an existing social enterprise is Anamiki Indigenous Technology. Um, what Anamiki does is it's a digital services agency. So they do things like website design, branding, custom software, digital communications. They've also got a, an indigenous data sovereignty product. Um, and so they've raised $750,000 as equity investment. So they've exchanged shares for this investment from Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. And they've raised another $250,000 from BDC Indigenous Entrepreneur Loan Program. So that would be a loan um, to, and they use, use that million dollars in totality to build out their team. They've further developed their products. And through those new products, service revenues will be used to repay the investment over a period of time. So a great example of scaling an existing social enterprise using social finance investment. And the last example that I'll talk through today is from Atlantic Canada, um, Farmworks Investment Cooperative is a for-profit Nova Scotia Community Economic Development Investment Fund, so a CDF. And they've raised probably well over this now, but $2.7 million from 430 primarily local shareholders. And what they do is they lend this money to local food-related businesses, could be markets or, or producers or processors, um, and they're growing healthy farms and producing quality food. And, and in aggregate, that's employing 350 people. And they use the annual revenues to repay back those loans at the time. So those are five different use cases and several different examples of purchasing an asset, being able to take repayable investment to either earn revenue later, or generate savings later, or prevent costs from it being incurred or you can launch or scale an existing um, ent social enterprise. So those are five different use cases. Um, if you're at the stage of learning about this and trying to suss out, you know, could social finance be for us in our organization? This exercise might be for you. Um, and we're not gonna do this exercise here, um, but I just wanna refer you to it. These are prompting questions in each of those use cases. And the purpose is not to answer or fill in the blank in each one of these. It's just to get the brainstorm going and flowing in your organization. Um, and so it's you know leading questions. You know, what if we could invest in X, or what if we hired someone to do this, or how might we um, rent out our space, or what could we sell, or could we license out our knowledge here? Um, 
And so the idea is, you know, not answering each of these questions, but using them as prompts for inspiration. And once you get these slides, you'll be able to click and download these free worksheets. And these are three different exercises to help you brainstorm and then start to filter and converge on the ideas that are going to be mission aligned, that's going to be financially feasible and operationally viable for your organization to both conceive of, implement, and succeed and thrive in. So let me pause there for any questions so far. Um, any questions about what is social finance? Any questions of the examples around what is social finance at work and, and how you might go about generating ideas to use social finance in your organization? So you're welcome to um, unmute and, and ask that question or you can type in the chat. All right, no worries. If there's no questions, let's move on. And just note, you are always welcome to ask questions in the chat box as we proceed and, and I'll pause for questions to go. All right, so moving on in our roadmap, let's talk about, you know, social finance opportunities. You know, great, that's what we, you know, that's what is social finance? How do we use it now in our organization? Um, so I'm gonna point to this tool that is on the InnoWeave site, which is basically a landscape of all the different social finance investors across Canada. And you can use this once you are investment ready and you have a clear project to filter, you know, what impact is that project going to have? So what sector might it fall within? What target geography might it cover? Um, what type of legal structure are you looking for investment into? Is it a nonprofit? Is it a charity? Is it a cooperative? Is it a for-profit social enterprise? Um, what sort of, what type of social finance are you looking for? Is it equity or, or a loan? Um, what type of loan, et cetera? What type of returns might you imagine being able to generate and successfully be able to repay? Um, and what amount of money do you need up front? Um, so you'd be able to go in and filter for all of those different parameters and out comes a short list of the most appropriate investors for your project. And I would treat this as a good starting point. Um, it's certainly not comprehensive. Um, and many of the different social finance investors such as Aboriginal finance institutions are, are just lumped in as a, as a type. And so, you know, despite there being some 59 or 60 different AFIs available. Um, so treat this as a great starting point. And I see Amina is asking a question, um, is the social finance investor spreadsheet you're looking at being provided to us? And yes, this will be, it's, it's actually live on the website right now. Um, as soon as you get these slides, you'll be able to click in this and it'll take you directly to that page. All right, so that is the opportunity landscape. Um, and now the question is, you know, as I, as I qualified it, if you are ready, if you are investment ready, quote unquote, and you know, what does that actually mean? What does investment ready mean? What does it mean to be ready to go and reach out to some of these social finance investors? And so that is basically our next topic. And the kind of bad news is um, there really is not a recipe, which, you know, if you could go down a checklist, you can check all the boxes and, and you will be guaranteed to be ready for investment. Um, unfortunately, that isn't the case. But what I can point to are some common ingredients, um, which are quite typical. And most, if not all, social finance investors will really look at this um, in earnest. And, and you have to demonstrate strength in all of these areas. So the first ingredient that I want to talk about is the team. Um, so the team really matters. Um, the earlier stage that your organization is, or the, the less track record that you have, the more that the team matters. And it's who the team is, um, what skills you have, what experience, what backgrounds you bring, um, the networks that you're, that you're tapped into. Um, and 
you know, if you're a startup or if you're early stage, um, that's okay. Maybe you can point to having worked or collaborated together in other contexts so that there's a, you know, a smooth and, and trusted relationship there that you can point to. Um, as well as who you are and sort of the core team, who's around that core team? What advisors do you have? What expertise do they bring? What networks do they uh, have? Um, what it, you know, who's on your board? Um, and, um, and what experience or expertise or networks and value add does your board bring? Um, and if you have consultants, the same. And in addition to the people, what sort of systems do you have at play to, to make the smooth uh, team execution? So thinking about your communication systems or your customer relationship systems or your financial management systems um, and, and so on. So the team and how you work well together really matters to investors. The second um, ingredient is the strategy and plan. So once you've got the right people around you, um, where is you know where is that team headed, um, and what is the vision and what is the mission that you all have? What are some milestones along the way, and what are the tactics and the strategies you're using to achieve those milestones? Um, and investors really care about yes, your plan A. But what if things go wrong? What are the risks inherent to the model that you're pursuing and the, and the project that you're executing? And what are your mitigation strategies? Um, what's your plan B or C or D and E and so forth? And the idea here is that investors aren't going to expect that you have a full corporate playbook for you know, everything under the sun. For instance, you know, not, most of us probably would not have predicted COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but the idea is what are the core inherent um, foreseeable risks, um, and what are you going to do about them? And this is quite different than maybe traditional nonprofit funding where, you know, you, you really want plan A and you want to stick to plan A and execute that at, at you know, at all measures. Um, investors really care about managing risk and, and they want to understand multiple different types of plans in different contexts should uh, things not quite go in your favor or, or, or to your original plan. So you've got the team You've got a really clear strategy and plan on, on how you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. And then, you know, why are we doing this to begin with? That third ingredient for investment readiness is the impact at the end of the day. That's our purpose. That's our why. Um, so can you clearly articulate and demonstrate that impact model? How do you move from what you're doing, the inputs and the activities through to what that immediately achieves, the outputs? to the outcomes and the ultimate impacts at the end of the day? What's that theory of change? And how do you measure this both quantitatively and qualitatively? Um, and here there's a uh, growing body of um, knowledge and resources as well as a community of practice around something called the common approach to impact measurement, where it is not necessarily prescribing to organizations what to measure. So, you know, it's not going to say you must be measuring greenhouse gas um, emissions reduced or um, jobs created for marginalized communities or something like that. Um, though, of course, all of those things are very important. Um, but it is going to try to prescribe to you an approach, a methodology, which if you can demonstrate traction in, it demonstrates to an investor that you are rigorous and serious about the impacts that you seek. Um, and so that approach is roughly planning out your change, um, selecting the impact measurements um, that, that measure that change. And, and it can come from quote unquote, like industry standards. So things like the sustainable development goals, those 17 UN goals, it's sometimes referred to as the, the world's to-do list. Um, you can also, I can point to different systems such as IRIS or Pulse or GEARS, um, there's uh, the impact measurement project. So there's any number of these different sort of industry standards. The common approach to impact measurement is sort of agnostic to any one different standard. Um, but the idea here is you, you pick the impact measurement metrics that matter in, in your organization. And then you want to hold yourself accountable to that. So measure what actually matters um, and actually do something with it. Take action on those measurements. So create a dashboard for yourself and regularly recalibrate the what and how of, of your work so that you're maximizing that impact. 
um, and then as transparently as possible, report out what impacts you are having. If you happen to have a uh, annual report, you want to add in the impact story of your social finance project or, or your project that you're pursuing. Um, if, you, if you don't quite have an annual report, maybe it can just be a separate impact report, um, but you want to transparently share that impact story. So now you've got the team as the ingredient and you, and you know where that team is headed in terms of the vision and the strategy to get there and how you're managing risk along the way as well as the purpose of all of that, you know, what impact you're seeking at the end of the day, investors are still going to be numbers people. And so the fourth ingredient is the financial model. And here they're going to go quite deep. They're going to want to understand your history. Um, so they'll look at your three financial statements, which, which any accountant will typically point to. So these are your balance sheet, your income statement or, or statement of operations um, or the cash flow statement. So um, those three sort of financial statements are pretty standard. They'll want to understand that for as long as you have them, um, but typically in the three to five years range, ideally those are audited, but most investors understand that um, earlier stage organizations may not be at the uh, capacity to you know, have audited statements. And so if they are prepared um, and sort of verified by, uh, an external accountant or someone with a CA or a CPA type of designation that really helps and again builds confidence in the numbers. Um, you know, typically what you send to your board can also be uh, acceptable as well. But they'll want to get comfortable with your history. Any, any past borrowing history goes a really long way to demonstrate that you have been able to withdraw or take money, manage that well, and repay it. Um, so even things like a line of credit, demonstrating that you can manage money effectively. Um, they'll also want to understand your past donors and, and revenues and, and where those contracts or pledges have come from and, and what the projection is going to look like. And so that kind of leads in from history to what your present picture is, if you have any existing debts or outstanding debts, what your major donors are today or, or revenue sources are today. And then that leads into your future, which is the third piece of the financial model that they'll really want to dive into. Um, and these are essentially forecasted balance sheets and income statements and, and cash flow statements. Um, and of course, no individual um, can foresee the future clearly. So they'll want to understand your future in a few different scenarios. Um, so they'll want to understand a, um, a base case scenario, what's most likely, um, maybe a worst case scenario or a conservative scenario, as well as a best case scenario or an aggressive scenario. If everything goes in your favor, what does that picture look like? Um, so ideally you wanna present a few different scenarios, clearly outlining what the assumptions are in order to derive any one of those scenarios. So, so now you've got the team, um, you've got a strategy and plan and risk mitigation um, plan as well in place. And you've got sort of your reason why you're doing this work and, and your clearly articulated impact model. And you've got the financial model as well to back this up. Um, the last ingredient, ingredient is your investor approach. And sometimes called, you know, um, called the due diligence package or your deal room. So by investor approach, I mean, um, you know, bringing to the table the right investors for you. So for instance, I've seen where conversations have gone wrong, where maybe you are a clean energy organization seeking greenhouse gas emission reduction and renewable energy production, um, but you might be speaking to a sustainable food investor. And you know, right from the beginning, that, that conversation is not going to go well. So really trying to match the right investor with, um, with what your project is trying to achieve. And that's all in your approach, doing, doing your homework, um, shortlisting the right investors for you. And some of the tools that we're gonna present um, in this webinar will help you do that as well. And then once you've got your shortlist of, of who to approach, um, then being ready to have those conversations. And I'm just gonna park that for right now um, because I've got a sort of detailed slide on, on that next. Um, but any questions so far about the other four ingredients, be it the team, the strategy and plan, the impact model, or the financial model. And um, I'm just gonna check the chat. I see Peter has kindly shared uh, a resource, so thank you so much. Um, essentially, 
something to get to a one page business plan, which is great. So eplans.com, mplans.com. I'm personally not familiar with them, but thank you, Peter. Um, Wayne, this is Thomas Barakos from um, Montreal. Hi, uh, Thomas. Hi, quick question on the impact model. You mentioned um, the theory of change, and I, I know that's part of uh, the foundation's approach to, to investing. So uh, could, could you tell us a little more about what goes into that, um, that process uh, to, to appeal, to, to, to build that impact model? Sure, yeah, great question. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so a theory of change is, um, you know, it, it is ultimately a, a deliverable, but the process matters in some ways more because um, it takes you through the determining your intended impact. So what it is that you're trying to achieve um, for whom, so who are your target groups, who's your beneficiaries or customers or, or, or users, um, what impacts are you trying to achieve with them, what outcomes, what changes, how are you going to achieve, achieve them, um, and and when in what time frame. So uh, theory of change kind of walks you through and it helps you articulate that. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the process or like how you would go about making that, um, you may want to visit innoweave.ca and navigate yourself to the impact and strategic clarity stream. Um, and maybe if, I, if I'm not putting Anna Sophia on the spot, if you don't mind typing in the link to that impact and strategic clarity coaching stream, that might help Thomas as well. And sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, Anna. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great question. Are there any other questions um, in the? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so there you go. That is the the link to Impact Industry Clarity, and that will have resources and and a process as well that you can learn about to develop your theory of change. Any other questions about uh, those ingredients for investment readiness before I proceed? Okay, all right, let's go on. So I told you that I was parking this due diligence package or otherwise the deal room. So this next slide kind of walks you through that in a bit more detail. It helps you identify, well, what might an investor ask for and therefore what should I prepare ahead of time? And um, again, try not to treat the last slide or this slide as a checklist. Um, it's not meant for you to go in and rigorously prepare each of these little bullet points because more than likely an investor has some overlap here. They have maybe some things that are not listed here and some things that are listed here, they may not request from you. So treat it as a very good starting point. Um, again, you wouldn't necessarily need all of these things from day zero, um, but certainly by the end of the fundraising process, you're gonna need, you know, if not all of them, you know, 80% or so of these things will have been discussed or supplied to the investment partner. So what are they gonna ask for? They're gonna to want to know your organization, of course. So they might ask for your strategic plan or business plan. Um, they might ask for your history in terms of like an annual report or brochure or any documents that you've been sharing with your board in terms of updates, uh, in, ter in terms of progress or status. Um, they'll also want to understand your team. So resumes or CVs of the board management, key staff, even, even if those staff are volunteers, if, if they're core to the operation and success, um, they would want to understand who they are. Um, of course, your registration documents and corporation and um, any other legal compliance documentation. Letters of support really go a long way. Um, letters of support from stakeholders, such as your beneficiaries, your customers, from other partners, from suppliers or, or, um, or vendors that you're working with. Um, or, or any like, community partner that is involved or engaged in the project um, go a really long way to demonstrate both need and um, you know, a positive testimonial on your project being valuable. This next section around asset financing is specifically if you are looking to do that first use case from, from earlier in the webinar. So if you're purchasing an asset, then you're going to need the description of that asset. Um, like if it's a building, a description of the, the lot and the building, um, they're going to want to understand your budget and vendor quotes for the asset purchase. 
construction or any renovations, any ongoing maintenance that might be required or insurance that might be needed, um, and copies of those associated contracts and agreements as well with those technical supports, be it an engineer or an architect or whoever. So that, that section is particularly if you're talking about purchasing an asset. So again, if I zoom out more broadly, what investors are going to be looking for is your financial information. And I've more or less talked you through that already, but there it is in sort of bulleted form. Um, and again, audited financial statements, don't feel too scared by that. Um, um, that is obviously the, the most uh, demanding from a financial statement provision perspective, but um, sometimes they can accept management accounts or account, accountant prepared accounts. Um, and lastly, the impact as well. So they'll want to understand your impact metrics, stories, te uh, customer testimonials, a theory of change or a logic model, essentially an articulation of how you move from what it is that you're doing to the ultimate impacts that you seek. Um, the impact measurement approach, like how do you understand that that change is happening? And increasingly, investors are going to ask about your contribution to the sustainable development goals, those UN 17 goals that um, UN, United Nations have uh, subscribed to. All right, so these are some of the documents that will go into what's called your deal room. And um, one of the last content slides that I'll go through today is when, when you're in that conversation, when you're negotiating with investors and, and you're discussing, um, you know, taking on that type of investment partnership, there is, of course, that power dynamic. You know, you, you are an organization that's looking for investment to carry out the project that you really wish uh, you could bring to fruition. And the investor on the sort of other side of that uh, fictitious table is you know, controlling that money and, and helping decide how that money should flow and if it would flow to you, your project. Um, and one way to balance that power dynamic a little bit, um, certainly doesn't take it away completely, obviously, um, but one way to balance it is to also think about what you should look for in an investor. And my suggestion is look for a partner, not only the money. Um, so it's completely rational and logical for organizations to often focus on, you know, things like the interest rate or reporting requirements or collateral terms or, or anything like that. Apologies if you hear a puppy in the background. Um, and while those things are all critically important, also consider a few things that would add value in other ways aside from just the money. Um, so think about who else have they invested in? What's in their portfolio? Are there any synergies? Um, could you um, do any joint activities together with them? Could you learn or share with them? Um, what about the investors, other benefits or other services that they offer? What other value add do they bring to your project? Um, sometimes investors have a sort of sidecar um, technical assistance facility. So, you know, if, if something comes up midway in your project and you needed some legal advice, um, they may have uh, grants available that you can access to pay for that because it's in everyone's interest for you to access that type of legal advice. Um, so think about what other value add they bring and you can ask about that. And also think about the network that they are tapped into. Who could they introduce you to? Perhaps you've been pursuing a particular um, uh, decision maker and you, you struggle to get their ear or, or get audience with them. So maybe you've seen the investor that you're speaking with sit on a panel with that individual. And so you know that at least they're in touch and maybe they would be willing to introduce you to that decision maker or to that policy maker or whoever. So think about your broad theory of change um, and look for a partner in that at every step of the way, not just an investment or not just money. All right. So finally, um, what we've kind of gone through today is you know, some examples of social finance. Um, we've, we've talked a bit about the use cases and um, how your peers in the sector have successfully used social finance to advance their mission. We talked a little bit about some opportunities and who you would go to to access the social finance and, and how you might prepare so that you can have a successful relationship and, and engagement with them. Um, so at the stage that you're at now, a tool like this to assess your project might be useful. 
Um, and again, you're going to get this slide at the end of this, so I wouldn't stress too much about um, filling it in right now. But I just want to point you to these are a set of quick um, assessment questions. So it's basically trying to get at, you know, is this project right for us? Will it achieve our mission? Is it going to be financially feasible? And is it operationally feasible? And it's basically a, a bit of a gut check or a sanity check. Um, and so how I would use this tool is to look at your, your project and think about, let's you know go, kind of go row by row and say, okay, does this align with our purpose? If it does, put a check mark. If you're very confident that it does, then you're okay, you can move on to that next section. If you're not confident, you could put an X and you can put some open questions there. Um, and if you are sort of just unsure, you're not quite cle clear on if it does you know, align with your purpose or your values or your mission, you put a question mark for now and put in some open questions that you want to spend time later on answering. And this will just help you assess, okay, potentially you've got multiple ideas on the go and you're trying to assess well, which one is right for us to pursue or which is the most timely idea for us at this moment in time. Um, this will help you kind of narrow in and converge on the right idea to pursue. So let's go to another poll um, and let's see you know, what type of investment readiness supports you are particularly looking for. Having gone through um, those ingredients and we've talked a bit about the use cases now, um, what might you see yourselves needing in your organizations to be successful in using social finance? So this question is should be showing up on your screens. Um, the question is, what investment readiness support does your organization need? And it's basically a multiple choice. So you know, check all that apply. Um, might you need to understand your customer or your beneficiary needs and, and sort of what that broader market opportunity is? Um, might you need to just generate project ideas that are actually aligned to your vision, that are aligned to your mission, your values, your purpose? Um, do you need help assessing the viability or the operational feasibility of your idea? Do you need help thinking through the impact measurement and the management approach and those metrics? Um, do you need help managing the finances and modeling out and forecasting what this could do financially? We're bringing that all together in a full business plan um, and project plan, perhaps. Or, or, or you pass that and you're really thinking through, well, how do I start this up now? How do I bring this idea to fruition? How do I operationalize this? Um, or maybe you're past that too, and, and now it's really the struggle of like, how do I gain traction? Um, how do I find those users and get in front of those customers or um, recruit them to, to use the product or use the service or engage in, in the project? Um, or maybe I'm at the stage of kind of, you know, I, I feel like there's a good idea here and, and I'm really trying to get in front of investors now and I need help kind of preparing that deal room. So go ahead, I'll give you a, a few more seconds um, to try to answer this for yourselves. Um, and this can also just be used as a really good reflection point as well for where, where you are and what you might need to be successful in using social finance at your organization. Okay, great. So thank you all for those who are uh, responding. I'll just share the results so far. Um, and yeah, it looks like um, we've got you know a little bit of everything and, and that's understandable. So a lot of interest around assessing the financial and operational feasibility. Um, that makes a lot of sense. It seems like we've got ideas and now you're wondering about how to bring it to fruition and that very much aligns with this next sort of um, very popular response, which is kind of gaining traction and how do we bring this in front of users and, and paying customers. Um, and then you know, lots of uh, sort of interest in around business planning, and developing that deal room, which, which can be um, arduous and, and of course take resources to do that work. So this makes a lot of sense. And, and so the, you know, the obvious question is, well, where might we go from here? So we've understood where those social finance um, opportunities are and kind of where our projects are strong or weak, or where we need help, you know, where do we get that help now? Um, so in terms of next steps, um, I just want to put a few different 
uh, resources um, in front of you. So if you're looking for the right supports now, here's four different directions you can go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the top left, that blue box there, is the social enterprise coach directory. So these are individual coaches that would offer one-to-one -one support and advice to help you in developing your social enterprise. So if you are launching or scaling or um, growing an existing social enterprise, um, again, you can click on that link um, or click anywhere in that box and it should take you directly to the social enterprise coach directory. And, and again, you'd be able to filter for your geography, your language, um, and you can click on their bios and, and get to know if, if you think there's a good fit for, for you, you and your project. Um, and maybe reach out to two or three of them and have a discussion about what it is you're trying to do and what your needs are based on the conversations that we've had today. Um, and you know, see if they can help you. On the, on the right hand side, on the top uh, right, in that green box, you've got social finance coaches. So the, these again are individual um, coaches. You can offer one-to-one -one support specifically around social finance investment readiness. And, and that's uh, use case um, agnostic. So if you're purchasing a building or just doing those cash flow financing opportunities such as retrofits or social impact bonds or um, hiring on additional fundraising capacity in which you're going to repay an investment to, um, but for the purposes of generating savings or generating revenue later, these are the coaches that might help you figure that out. And on the bottom left-hand corner, you've got service organizations, which is a directory of organizations or firms. Um, so they might provide some similar services to coaches and in, in, um, in the top uh, two boxes, but these might also include accountants and lawyers, um, tax people, um, HR people. And so these are a bit more holistic in, in helping you identify and, and um, meet your needs um, for becoming investment ready. And then once you are investment ready and you're confident that you want to have those conversations with the social finance investors, the bottom right-hand corner there, the social finance investor directory is where you want to go and you can click there. And again, it'll bring up that sort of spreadsheet, that air table, um, which will enable you to filter for the type of social finance investor that will be right for you. All right, so I'll just share quickly what that looks like. But again, once you get these slides, you'll be able to click through to all of these, but this is effectively what um, you'll be navigating to to find those coaches. Um, and you just click on needaweave.ca, our coaches, and you can filter by your province, by your language, by the coach um, stream. So that would be social enterprise in this case. And conversely, when you're looking at the service providers, it will look like an air table as well. So again, you can filter by the types of needs that you might have, um, the different types of organizations in your stage. So if you're just starting up or if you're an early stage organization, uh, depending on your geography or the type of service you might want, if it's kind of more group-based to, to save on cost or one-to-one -one supports, um, not necessarily that one-to-one -one is more expensive, but um, the, the sort of environment that you might want to have, um, you would be able to find and shortlist the service providers that might be right for you. And that brings us to a close for today. So we can definitely stay on for another um, nine or 10 minutes. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for joining in today. Um, this was the Social Finance Investment Readiness Webinar. If you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them now. And if you uh, leave the session or are reviewing these slides later on or, or watching this recording, um, please feel free to email me at socialfinance.inaweave.ca and I will be um, quite responsive and be happy to help you. Thank you so much. So I will end this recording and just uh, take questions.